let's start. It's still a little bit busy at the coffee break, but uh, uh, yeah, people can join anytime. Um, hello and welcome. Uh, we continue this morning uh, pre-sessions uh, with a session um, organized by the Dynamic Coalition on DNS issues. And we will have a look into the very popular piece of legislation called NIS2 Directive. And we will have a look uh, to the aspects who is effective by this uh, directive and uh, also what it means uh, for the fight against the online harms. And I have, uh, let me introduce myself, uh, even for uh, many of us were here for the first session. My name is Regina Fuxova, and I work for URIT, the .eu registry. And uh, I have the pleasure to welcome our today's speakers uh, uh, online. Uh, we have uh, Prudence Malinki. Hello. Uh, she is the head of uh, industry relations at Mark Monitor. Uh, then uh, uh, Katrina Sataki, the chief executive of uh, the .lv registry. Hello. <laughs> and Georgia Osborne, the senior research analyst and academic outreach and partnership lead at the DNS Research Federation. So um, let's start with the scene setting of this session. And um, I would like to invite Georgia to uh, share with us the so-called NIS2 transposition uh, tracker, which was uh, recently launched by the DNS Research Federation. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Regina, um, and thank you to all of you in the room. Um, we've briefly heard a sort of introduction, I guess, to what the NIS2 or NIS2 um, a directive means for, for us. Um, but I'm going to give you an overview um, just now of what it might mean. So I'll just wait for a couple more people to come in. So the NIS2 directive um, or the Network and Information Security 2.0 directive lays down measures that aim to achieve a common level of cybersecurity across the European Union. Um, but as a directive, it is complex to transpose and the deadline is October this year. Um, and the DNS Research Federation have embarked on a pretty ambitious project, um, but it's very exciting around the NIST 2 directive. Um, and as part of this project, we have developed um, a NIST 2 Article 28 tracker. Um, so this shows different stages of where countries and member states are in regards to transposition. This is obviously an incredibly difficult thing to do, not only because they're all in several different languages, um, but also it is often sometimes in the second legislative text that you see the, where, where it comes out. Um, so we have created this tracker and it shows so mainly four different stages. Um, I guess the interesting ones for us are where it's completed. So, um, you can see, I think there's only two really fully completed, I believe, but we can actually go to where it says in phase not started. Now, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with this because it's very difficult to track. There are often things we are not aware of. There will be areas that have been updated recently that we will not be tracking. Um, so this is where we want to call out to you and the community. If you in your member state know that this is not correct, please let us know. Um, our email address to send in information to is um, support at dnsrf.org. Um, and you can see here all the preparation. So we've got a few consultations open. And when we click in to the consultations that are open, you can see different areas that we're tracking. So you can see um, where to go for the consultation and when the consultation period ends. Um, of course, again, this is not always um, going to be correct. We want to be able to make this available for, for you all. Um, and if you have any pieces of information, um, anything that you know um, that isn't currently on the tracker, we'd really appreciate it. I think it's a very good start to have, have it all in one place. It's very difficult to track. I'm sure many of you are tracking it for your own purposes, um, but it's very good to have it all in one place. So it's... 
you have to have special knowledge and you have to examine the legal text carefully. So we've got our team of policy um, specialists researching it. Um, and we have um, one country who is transposed, which is Croatia, I believe. Um, let's see. Yes. Um, and then we've got a couple of them that are currently in the implementation phase. So if we go to the implementation phase, we have Hungar Hungary and Belgium as well in there. Um, so those are the two ones that we have currently noted down. And the other 20 states are in the preparation um, and you can always correct us when things are incorrect or when the consultation period has, has ended or perhaps they've, they've opened up a consultation. Um, we're also tracking in interesting elements of the legislation, like, for example, if EIDs are specifically called out in the legislation, um, I believe they are, and, and perhaps um, one, of, one of you might be able to know more, but I believe CZNIC are, are, have mentioned EIDs in the actual legislative text, um, so we're tracking when that's, when that's the case, but also, um, for example, if in the legislative text of the NIST 2 directive, proxy and privacy providers as well as resellers are explicitly called out. So we're also looking at when in legislative text they are explicitly called out in the national legislation. Um, and I just want to highlight before we sort of move on, the purpose of this session is to look at um, how it affects the online um, sort of harms, how, what, what it means for DNS abuse, what it means for online harms. Um, the second part of this project that we're doing is called ecosystem discovery, and that will look at the wider ecosystem, how it, how we are all affected by the NIST two directive, um, including proxy privacy providers and resellers, um, which have been explicitly called out in the NIST two directive. Um, so I won't take too much of your time just now. I will hand over to Regina, but I'm happy to continue and take some of your questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and is there some uh, immediate question to Georgia? Yes. I think it's very informative and very useful for all of us. I, I just have a curiosity. Is, uh, where did you, uh, if it was difficult to identify reliable sources for all of this information, and how often do you update it? That's a very good question. How often do we update it? Um, yes, I will, yeah. So um, you've asked, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. um, so it is very difficult to, to update. And you've asked how Repeat. often the question. The, 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 the quest, yeah, so, but, but maybe the question was not yes. auditable, it looks like. So yeah, uh, so. Yes, yes. yes. So, so, so you've just asked how often we update it and with the reliable sources, you know, how, how often do we update it with the sources that we have. Um, so we have a team of really exceptional policy specialists. Um, we have a couple of people who update it regularly, but of course it is difficult to, to keep them track of it. Um, they look at it in terms of where they are, um, they have that language. Um, or perhaps we know somebody who has that language, you know, who speaks the language of the text um, and they update it through that. But really, to, to be quite honest, it's crowdsourced a lot of it because it is difficult. Sometimes we find that um, consultation periods are open um, suddenly and then they'll close and, and we have mm -hmm. to kind of get on top of it very fast. And I'm sure that's a very familiar issue to you all. Um, so we're trying to provide this resource for, for everyone, really. Thank you, Georgia. I have a follow-up question. If in the tracker, if you are also uh, saving the, the links to the pieces of legislation themselves, mm -hmm. because they are also now in different phases, some are just in the legislation proposal draft, some are already um, approved, and also the date of effect of the local yes yes i believe we are um but it might not be in the tracker just yet in terms of dates um so okay. i mean if there is an area of interest that you think is important that we should include we'd also welcome that as well so you know when something is in draft legislation you know when something is in draft when something has been you know uh, finalized 
um, and dates of that. Um, I think that's something that, that we will include. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Katrina, I would like to ask you still within the borders of uh, uh, setting the scene, if you can uh, uh, share with us um, your uh, um, approach or your, uh, so far, your experience with, uh, um, uh, with the transposition of the NIST2 directive for uh, uh, the uh, LB registry as, as one of the CCTLD uh, managers. Yep. Um, thank you very much, uh, Regina, and thank you, Georgia, for setting the scene. Uh, this morning, I realized that this is the first time anyone has ever asked me to talk about NIS2, and I suspect that might be the last time. Um, and I'll start by uh, well, probably more than five years old history. Uh, when we uh, implemented um, uh, GDPR, uh, we got a request from one of the customers uh, who said, uh, why do you require my, my phone number? You never call me. So we reviewed uh, our policies, we re reviewed the data that we uh, process, and we concluded, yes, he's right. We have no reason whatsoever to ask for his phone number. So we removed the requirement for uh, the uh, mandatory, this mandatory field. So it, now it's optional. You want to give us your phone number, please do. But we do not require it. And now I read Article 28, which says that phone number is a required field. Uh, I'm still uh, curious how it's going to help with DNS security, stability, and resiliency. Uh, but that is one of the examples that shows uh, how uh, much time we have to uh, spend on uh, compliance and implementing uh, requirements. And then those requirements may change. And we, again, are... Uh, working on implementing uh, some uh, new, new things in our systems. And we are a very small registry, a very small registry. We, our, our resources are very limited. So how can we cope with all those requirements, which sometimes, I'm sorry, do not make any sense, and still have enough power, energy to innovate, to ensure like things that we must do, ensure security, stability, and resilience of DNS. I, I'm, I'm not arguing that, uh, that accurate uh, data would uh, help with uh, other cybersecurity issues, but don't state that that is going to help with uh, security, stability, and resilience with all of DNS. Again, I'm not saying that uh, it's probably not going to help at all, but but uh, just make your narrative right. Yes, and for us as a small registry, it is a challenge. Uh, and then IS2 is just one of the examples because there are many other, uh, many other uh, legal requirements that we have to implement. And if uh, roughly 10 years ago, we spent around uh, 50, 20% of our time on the ensuring compliance with different legal acts, Nowadays, it's at least 80%. And again, uh, as I asked uh, rhetorically, um, when will we have uh, time, resources, and everything else to ensure that we do what we are supposed to do? So that is one of the things that uh, has not been uh, considered when uh, coming up with, with all, all those new regulations, and well, including directive, of course. So. Um, this is, um, again, for, for us as a small registry, uh, we rely very much on the bigger registries because they are the ones that uh, have more resources and they are ahead of the curve. They always uh, share with the center community center. That's a regional organization of the European uh, CCTLDs. And CCTOD stands for uh, Country Code Top Level Domain Registry. Uh, they are helping us um, to, 
to understand what to, what to do, where to go, they uh, come up with uh, some ideas how to ensure verification of, of data and, and, and many other th uh, things. So really big thanks go to the bigger registries that help us. Um, I remember there was uh, the time when NIS uh, was reviewed and uh, we had calls with people who reviewed NIS2, how it has been implemented. And we had very high hopes because we shared these problems. We shared the problems that smaller registries face uh, and we hoped that uh, things will get better. Well, they didn't. Uh, so again, um, we very much rely on, on uh, help from, from um, bigger registries. And then another issue is uh, uh, competition. We, as smaller registries, are not as interesting for uh, registrars as the bigger registries. And uh, I, I, well, we as small registries struggle, and I can't even imagine, and hopefully uh, uh, Prudence will share with us, how registrars have to struggle with all the different implementations in different member states. And I'm sure that uh, first of all, they will pay attention to the bigger registries. They will make sure that uh, their primary customer base uh, is being served well. And maybe at some point they will um, get to us. Uh, what will happen uh, meanwhile? I don't know. Uh, we uh, also uh, talked to, uh, well, some time ago, uh, actually last year, we shared uh, with our local registrars uh, information about the upcoming NIS2 and uh, what they uh, might expect. Uh, but our local registrars are also small registrars. They, uh, I'm sure they struggle uh, much more than the bigger registrars. So how will, uh, how will the market look like in a couple of years when those smaller registrars will not be able to um, follow all the uh, requirements? I don't know, probably we'll see even more uh, and further uh, market consolidation and even bigger uh, registrars and smaller registrars just might go out of uh, business, which would be very sad for us uh, as the .lv registry because uh, smaller registrars are probably uh, uh, more, especially local registrars, are more interested in, in .lv than uh, the big uh, players uh, of the industry. I could go on forever, but I think that uh, uh, I will have a chance to, to share some more um, insights a little bit later in the session. So, Thank you very much, but... Katrina, for your initial thoughts. Is there some immediate question to Katrina? Uh, there's a person who is raising their hand. No more. Oh, no more. Yes. No more. Yeah. No more. No more. Okay, yes. so there will be a. Uh, yes, there will be an opportunity later on. Is there some issue with a uh, uh, Zoom audio for Prudence? She she has issues with. Yeah. Okay. It's all fine. So. Um, Prudence, uh, let's turn over to you. Um, I would like to, to ask you for your perspective uh, from the registrar community. Uh, do you share the concerns that Katrina just uh, explained to us? Uh, you uh, also like being a corporate registrar and if you can touch on uh, um, what does being a part of a corporate registrar, how does it change uh, the way that NIS2 is uh, impacting your business now and also uh, in the near future? So over to you, Prudence. Great, thank you so much. And um, I actually just wanna say a quick thanks to Katrina. That was some really salient um, feedback with regards to the impacts from a smaller registry perspective, which actually isn't a voice that has been heard so far with regards to the overall discussions relating to impacts of NIST 2. So this for me was really particularly insightful because ultimately what it conveys is that everyone's struggling right now and we're all having a bit of a bad time. Uh, which is a little bit reassuring because um, the registrar community, we are processing a lot. Um, 
and it, there's a lot of moving parts that are happening with regards to this too and we're still getting over GDPR so you know it seems to be waves various waves of legislation that's having gargantuan impacts to how we operate how we interact and then creating genuine obligations that have huge financial implications or consequences for failure to comply so you know the new world is quite a scary one um, but bringing it back on point uh, to the first question to do with uh, the corporate registrar um, allow me to just explain a little bit more about where I work. I work for a registrar called Mark Monitor. We are a corporate registrar, uh, which means that we're a little bit novel in the sense that we only work with companies and businesses or sometimes, you know, large multinational corporations. Now, with a NIST 2 perspective, what that means is that we're very lucky in the sense that the amount of personal data that we process or personal identifying information that comes through our hands is relatively minimal, but also it means that we are quite nuanced. Um, usually when you hear Mark Monitor, you hear the words white glove approach, uh, which is a little bit petrifying and also makes me think of Mickey Mouse. Uh, however, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> With that white glove approach, what that actually means is that we onboard our clients um, from the minute we sign the original contract, we do a bunch of onboarding and verification and validation of those entities from the beginning. So um, the registrant data verification and validation processes that are being implemented right now, we do very similar equivalents and have done since the inception of our business 25 years ago uh, when we onboard. Um, and what that means is from a practical perspective, for us, we're quite fortunate in the sense that we do a lot of our checks already. Um, and it also means from a NIST 2 perspective, sometimes we're able to have uh, or have allowances um, because it's we can prove that we already do that and we already do certain levels or certain standards of checks that are already compliant with NIST 2. However, that being said, um, it doesn't mean that there isn't any impact at all. The impact that we're facing is on lots of uh, lots of different practical ways. So uh, a corporate uh, client um, who would work with us as Mark Monitor would tend to do things such as a brand launch or product launch or, or a um, company uh, expansion. But what that would mean with regards to registrations is that our clients will register domain names across multiple TLDs simultaneously in one go. Um, now, what NIST 2 means is that we will have impacts with regards to registration process flow. And we are predicting or we're envisaging that there may be impacts to our registrant uh, experience with regards to how they register domain names, because even though hypothetically uh, everyone was supposed to have a, a like a consultative approach and a more standardized approach with how they're implementing this too, the realities that we're noticing is that registries are actually having varied approaches to how they're implementing things. And this isn't just down to like personal preferences or regional preferences. Sometimes there are legislative obligations that mean that they must implement this too in very specific ways to comply with their own um, like national law. Um, and as a result, what this means is that what historically was a smooth registration flow where we could place registrations at one go simultaneously across the board, we are predicting that we actually may not be able to do that in such a smooth transition way, which could impact our clients' ability to do launches or to simultaneously switch on domain names across Europe. Um, so this is one of the like impacts that is slightly unforeseen. Um, another thing that happened or that is currently happening um, was we experienced as a registrar a lot of inconsistency with regards to registry outreach. Um, some registries were really communicative and consultative with registrars and created like registrar groups to kind of process what's happening. And, and that was like a collaborative approach. Other registries, not so much. What we saw was that they took more of a kind of not dictatorial, that may seem a little bit extreme, but more of an approach of we are going to tell you what's happening and this is how it's going to happen and this is the new rules and there wasn't much scope for discussion or feedback 
of, of any kind. Um, so, you know, you had one extreme or the other extreme. Um, one of the things that we are aware of as a registrar is that, you know, NIST 2 or NIS 2, whichever you prefer, there is a, they're both the right answer, um, is the beginning. We've had GDPR, now we've got NIST 2. We are envisaging that there's going to be more legislative frameworks that are impacting our abilities to function as registrars and registries. Um, and one thing that we are very keen to advocate for is that when the next piece of legislation comes, um, what we'd love to see is for registries to adopt a more consultative approach where they work alongside uh, registrars and collaborate together to implement things in a practical way. And also requesting, and this is a, a hard ask, I know, I'm being really optimistic here, but a standardized approach, which will really minimize impacts with regards to systems. Because even though I've mentioned we as Mark Monitor, we are pretty much in a, a good position with regards to implementation. Other registrars aren't facing the same situation. So for a lot of retail registrars, and I'm putting on a completely different hat here, um, a lot of retail registrars with regards to the verification of personal ID, there's lots of different systems that are being requested. So they're having to implement a lot of different um, checks and processes. And also they're having to, on a really practical perspective, we're gonna, there's going to be requirements with regards to engineering resources, which is something that hasn't really been quite considered about how this gets implemented. Um, but one of the things is the allocation of engineering resources in order to even make this happen for a registrar takes time. Um, there's a roadmap that needs to be consulted. And so even though we've got all of these transposition deadlines and these deadlines to have things kind of implemented, the reality is for most registrars, you're gonna need more time. And I haven't even touched on the reseller registrar model, which is even more complex <laughs> because there's an additional flow of the chain. Um, and again, this is stuff that will really impact uh, timelines and implementation realities. Um, so these are some of the things that have been faced by registrars as well. Um, so there's been lots and lots of kind of different things that we've having to process and consider. And as uh, George's uh, really great tracker demonstrates, there's a lot more to come. Uh, the, the implementation stage or because it is not it is not quite there for a lot of different uh, countries so there's still a lot more transposition to come which means there's still a lot more scope for even more variation even more differing process flows even more differing implementation requirements so that's so, all <laughs> Thank you very much, Prudence. It uh, all sounds very complex. I'm just looking if there is immediate question to you from the audience. Uh, um, otherwise, I would like to uh, get back to Katrina. We heard uh, the challenges which registrars are facing and also the call for more cooperation and collaboration at the registry level but we know that NIST 2 is a directive, so it requires a, a local implementation. So from your perspective of a rather smaller uh, CCTLD manager, uh, how do you see the future here of a corporation to, to make the life of the registrars easier or how the registrars can make your life easier? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um... <laughs> Well, I think it's, uh, well, standardization and, and uh, uh, collaboration is the only way forward here, um, especially considering that this is directive. And even though I think that uh, those the directive will be implemented in more or less the same way in uh, different member states, it is not guaranteed. Of course, there uh, can be and most probably will be differences. Uh, I think the um, best way is to use a uh, center, as I mentioned, that's a regional organization for a European uh, country called top level domain uh, registries to discuss and uh, uh, to use it as a platform uh, to discuss how we can uh, make our lives easier. Uh, 
just not only for, for the other part, but also for ourselves. And that's what uh, registries already do. Uh, and I, I, I really hope that uh, um, we, we can find a solution. We must find a solution because it seems that nobody else is going to help us with that. Uh, we will have to do it ourselves. It's a gloomy <laughs> thing, <laughs> gloom future. Uh, yeah. But there's no other way. I, I don't see uh, any uh, help from, so far I haven't seen much help from uh, uh, the council or, yeah. I see there's a comment. No, there's no comment. No. No. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there is a clear, significant impact on different stakeholders. And uh, yeah, the question is how or, or which stakeholders should take the lead, also taking into account this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, international environment of, uh, or cross-border environment. Um, I was also wondering if, uh, Maybe we could find some uh, inspiration in uh, other uh, industries. Um, this, this is a question to, to all panelists uh, that uh, if you see some uh, cross-industry cooperation to, to happen, maybe Georgia, if you can yes, um, start to react to this. Yeah, and um, so I think um, the first thing to note is that there are two cooperation groups um in car you know currently um i think uh the chair of it is finn peterson um gac representative um for denmark um and there's two work streams so the first one is the digital infrastructure and providers and the second one is who is um and so within that who is work stream there is um like two different ta task forces um so there's one on verification and one on legitimate access both are, you know, it's 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 incredibly important. Now, what happens in those groups um, is up to them, um, and that is, you know, that's built so that they can cooperate and have this kind of cross industry dialogue, communication between each other. Um, but but it's, you know, it is very hard, and they all want, you know, they all have different implementations of it. So um, the standardization, as much as we sort of would will it to happen is a difficult feat to to bring forth um, as harmonization is always the favorite word but it's very difficult in practice I think some thoughts from you Katrina on this cooperation and what it can bring uh, well I think I already uh, yeah. said what I think about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cooperation and, and, and uh, co collaboration. I just uh, probably would like to uh, comment a little uh, on Andrew's point in the chat. Um, because uh, if, if I remember correct, now it has to be uh, transposed by, by October this maybe, year. Maybe but, just uh, for the audience, we will yeah. say that he pointed out that the deadline for compliance is the uh, so 17th of October. Yeah, but so I think it was, uh, uh, it was about transposition, not about compliance. I think. Yeah, but uh, but uh, we still have some time to 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 be compliant because uh, uh, um, I, I don't think all these necessary solution uh, for for the uh, for us to be compliant will be there. Because it's it's, it's easy to say uh, be compliant uh, or fly to the moon, uh, but uh, um, tools are not there. Yes. <laughs> Throw down a challenge. Given that this too was published over a year ago, I think, uh, well, I've certainly given presentations of it uh, a year ago, it feels like the industry, so this isn't a comment on how this is just general, isn't taking it that seriously. There doesn't seem to be a sense of urgency given the scale of the potential financial penalties for non compliance. I, I have the sense that some other sectors are, are more, more focused, things like the finance sector, on action. Whereas I think the DNS industry as a whole, it's almost like it's been surprised. And, and I've seen a few presentations over the last few months, but not until then, it's been almost ignored by the industry as a whole. At least that's how I've seen it. 
Yeah, so um yeah. Well, yeah. Georgia will summarize. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. So the question that Andrew Campling said was um around, you know, the deadline is October um the 17th. And it and and you know uh, correct me if I'm if I'm repeating the question incorrectly, but um you said that you you don't think that the industry is taking it as seriously as they should and um, asking the panelists for comments around that. Yeah, you also mentioned a uh, 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 financial incentive to, to be compliant because there are fines. And that's actually something that uh, uh, really, mm. okay, and, and now I'm struggling to find uh, another nice word here. Now, again, from the perspective of a small registrar, we are struggling. We have limited resources, human resources, financial resources, any resources, you name it. So instead of asking, how can we help you to ensure that uh, you have uh, accurate data, that you, you, ensure you have a secure, uh, stable, and resilient uh, DNS. I mean, instead of asking that, I think, if you don't do that, we will take away from, from your limited resources, even though making them even smaller, which again uh, begs a uh, question. So how is that going to help? It is not going to help. So um, I can't say we, we don't take it seriously. On, 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 the, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the contrary, I think we it, maybe we take it too seriously. We just... Uh, um, have to do our best uh, and uh, and uh, ensure that uh, uh, so at least show that we are um, trying to comply, just like with GDPR. So if you're trying really hard, uh, you're probably uh, in the clear. Uh, but uh, speaking about um, uh, about uh, uh, application, um, I mean uh, compliance date, it uh, will probably the be different for different uh, countries, uh, depending on the uh, way uh, the directive is transposed. For example, uh, in our country, it will be, uh, well, compliance will be required starting from 1st July next year. So it's uh, it gives some time to implement it, which actually makes sense. Uh, I think local, uh, local uh, legislators are more sensible, so they understand that you can't uh, have uh, everything at once. But yeah, uh, sorry, probably that's all I can say uh, at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Um, I would like to turn back to, to Prudence. And uh, yeah, we discussed a little bit what could be done. There was a call for, uh, for cooperation. But can you tell us from uh, your perspective as the registrar, uh, what do you foresee uh, for possible pitfalls with regards to uh, Article 28 of the MIS Directive, which uh, creates uh, legal obligations not only for registries, but also uh, entities providing domain name registration services in relation to the WHOIS database? Okay. Well, that's a very long question. Okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, Pitfalls that I foresee, um, there is a little bit, Article 28 has <clears throat> something that's causing a little bit of confusion in the registrar community at the moment, and that's uh, under subsection 6, which is to do with the duplication of data um, and making sure that, uh, you know, there isn't a duplication of with, with regards to the collection and retention of that data in certain respects. So... Uh, we are still, because we're still in such early days with regards to how this is being transposed and what that means and how that's being interpreted, um, it's not necessarily entirely clear how that, what that means, but what we have noticed and um, what we, well, I say we, uh, when I say we, I mean more Mark Monitor uh, rather than the whole registrar community because we're just one of many. Um, one of the things that I think that has come to light is uh, we've noticed that certain uh, registries are providing reduced uh, registrant uh, data. Um, and what we 
are envisaging is that the NIST 2 kind of wording is broad enough to accommodate that rather than, um, you know, rather than those actions going against it. But it's too early to, to say. And I just wanted to go back to uh, Andrew's question about people or, or it not being taken seriously. Um, I do believe, Andrew, that registries and registrars are taking this very seriously because, you know, we are being created with specific legal obligations that are written and codified. So we are acting. However, there's just a lot of moving parts. So optically, it may seem like there isn't a lot of stuff happening, but behind the scenes, you know, there are groups at Centre that are having discussions. As Georgia pointed out, there were other subgroups that are also having discussions. Uh, registrars are keen to engage with registries as much as possible and participating in working groups as well to help assist the implementation. So it's done in a way to least impact the registration process flow. One thing ultimately, and I know I've mentioned this before, one thing that I genuinely am envisaging is that because we keep saying about standardization, we keep mentioning about harmonization, we keep talking about these goals, right? These, these um, you know, goals that we really want to try and aspire to achieve. As I've mentioned before, these goals are not necessarily achievable because of things such as, you know, obligations and national legislative requirements, which means that they will be deviances to how the legislation is transposed. That's a fact, that's a given. Um, it's just what we're envisaging or what we're predicting is that these differences will uh, vary quite broadly. And as such, the overall registrant experience with regards to trying to register across Europe will be impacted. And that's one of the things that we're kind of foreseeing as a as an impact um and but I do just wanted to bring it back to Andrew's previous point that you know as registrars as registries uh, that are impacted by this legislation we do take it seriously um it's just that there's a lot that we have to do and a lot that we're we can't control um and a lot that we're waiting for because it's still relatively early days even though we have such a tight turnaround from uh, in, in October thanks mm -hmm. Prudence, I have a follow-up question with all these obligations ahead. Do you plan to di differentiate between your uh, clients uh, from inside the EU and outside of the EU? Or what, uh, what is your take for the verification in the respect of NIST 2 and, and also the WHOIS database, uh, Article 28? That's a really great question. So right now, at this exact moment, we are treating all of our clients the same. So they all go through the same rigorous, strict verification validation process when they onboard and when we need to create profiles. Um, however, that being said, like with everything, this could be subject to change. Um, it's really down to what we start envisaging and, and viewing um, with the trans various transpositions when they start being implemented, right? Because if, and the, we, we, so we as a registrar are also going to have to take a really kind of pragmatic and practical and flexible approach. Because if we start seeing that there's certain obligations that are very distinct uh, for European clients um, that are completely different, then we may need to revise that and we may need to differentiate. But for now, <laughs> touch wood, um, we are able to treat uh, all of our clients the same and have the same strict and quite rigorous uh, verification processes. Right. Thank you very much. Um, since uh, we touched on the um, Article 28 and also uh, verification procedures for registration data, um, I would like to turn to, to Georgia. Uh, because you have been conducting uh, a research within the DNS Research Federation on the uh, KYC procedures, know your customers. So can you describe uh, the main findings of this research and uh, if you see some relevance uh, for the DNS industry? Yes. Um, so I guess it's relevant to the beginning of this conversation around um, you know, getting people's phone numbers and getting people, you know, who are people? know your customer, who are these customers. Um, so, and the reason why this is relevant for the NIST 2 directive is because articles 20, 21 and 28 
um, of the directive imposes obligation on the domain name, uh, domain name registrations to make available registration data um, and undertake fake data verification. So as a result, um, I've, we've conducted a series of um, a, a review of KYC policies across the industries. Um, so we've got four different industries, including banking and finance, um, insurance, um, domain name sector, and also dating apps now as well. So we're looking at, um, you know, KYC may not be a catch-all policy, um, but it does do a lot to help. So we're looking at it in a kind of comprehensive review to see where there are elements of the strengths and the weaknesses, the challenges and the opportunities of it, um, to come up with some recommendations for the domain name sector, which will be relevant when, when looking at the NIST2 directive. And this is it's very pert uh, pertinent to your point, Katrina, around, you know, it is difficult for CCs to be able to get the resources and also um, the technology to verify um, and to collect all this data. Um, so that's all in the review. Um, so I encourage you to read it when it's out, which will be hopefully by the end of this month um, or the beginning of next month. Um, so that is the KYC sort of review. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, is there some uh, question from the audience? Yes, Martha. Maybe if you can speak a little, little bit up because we were. Or, or... Uh, were you involved in the transposition of the directive into your national law? And if so, do you have the, the chance to, to let them know about your concerns, mainly regarding the, the, the Article 28? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So the question from the audience, from Marta from .pt. Uh, if uh, uh, we, uh, as the registry, have been uh, involved in uh, transposition, transposition of the directive into our uh, local law, and if uh, we could uh, share our our um, uh, worries. Uh, so. Um, well, we, we, our institution has been uh, an active participant in uh, in uh, the work of the uh, directive, but uh, Article Twenty Eight uh, is has, has has not been implemented yet. So currently, we are in the uh, implementing uh, the part where it speaks about uh, about. Uh, uh, who uh, who are affected parties and, and so how to determine if uh, the a part a party is uh, within the scope? Uh, so the transposition of uh, Article Twenty Eight will start later this year around September, and I hope we will be actively involved in in that process as well. Thank you for the question. That could be maybe potentially a good question to Prudence as well, because I would be also personally very much interested what are the, let's say, lobbying um, uh, possibilities of a corporate registrar or, uh, yeah, how how can you, like, if, if, if you are following up the process or if there is a space for you to be actively involved Yes, of course, there's um, scope to try and get actively involved, but the reality is what are the impacts of that engagement? Because again, there's only so much you can do and there's so many practical like uh, consequences of what you can do. Um, there are like ECHO um, uh, is an organization that did some incredible work lobbying specifically with regards to the EC uh, with NIST2 um, and uh, they've been doing some really fine work and working with uh, their members to ensure that they are doing some active political lobbying for this too. Um, we as Mark Monitor are obviously are members of ECHO. Um, we strongly encourage others to join if you're not a member already. Um, but also what we did was we took from both angles. So we took from the lobbying of uh, from the side of the EC and from a political angle, but then we also took a more practical um, perspective as well, working alongside and doing that collaboration with registries 
uh, to make sure that the implementation flow is being influenced as well in a productive way. So we participated in as many working groups that would have us <laughs> um, and try to kind of engage on that level as well. So we try to cover both bases, like the practical base, but then also the political base as well to make sure that we're advocating and lobbying and doing as much practical change that's helpful uh, as we could. Thank you very much. Uh, from the audience in the Zoom. Uh, is it a raised hand? Yes. So please, Carolina. Hi, Hello. this is, hi, this is uh, Carolina Cairo from the DNS Research Federation. I have two quick questions for the panel. Um, I think, yeah, the, the panel thus far has focused on Article 28, and I just wanted to um, ask everyone whether there are any other articles um, of concern um, for the DNS industry and the needs to directive um, from, you know, conversations with, you know, colleagues, we've, we've heard, you know, Article 20 on risk management governance and Article 21 um, on risk management uh, measures are, you know, also of relevance. So I would welcome any comments on uh, and, and thoughts on, on, yeah, any other articles that, that may be of relevance. Uh, and then I, I guess I, I had a, another follow-up question that sort of um, dovetails in, into uh, Prudence's um, um, uh, latter point just now. So from what I'm hearing, there's a lot of industry cooperation, but maybe happening in silos across existing communities, right? So Katrina was speaking about um, collaboration within the center uh, community. We're hearing about sort of member states, um, you know, having their sort of, you know, separate cooperation group. So, you know, going back to, to the question of, you know, cooperation, harmonization, you know, thinking of, you know, how do we sort of better standardize um, registration processes uh, to make sure, you know, they continue to be sort of smooth, uh, you know, a smooth experience. What, um, you know, how do we break these silos? And, and maybe it's about, um, you know, thinking of, you know, a, a wish <laughs> um, that the panel wants, wants to share with the group. Um, about how we uh, improve cooperation before uh, beyond sort of you know groups of you know like-minded organizations or or sister organizations. Thank you very much, Carolina. So we have basically two questions: one about the cooperation and how to improve it, and then uh, also what other articles are of uh, concern. So please feel free to pick up or uh, react to both of them. Georgia, would you like to start? I can, I can start on this one. Um, from conversations with colleagues, it is, um, you know, Article 28 is, is of concern, but then Article 21 is also something that, that people have picked up on as being a real concern. Um, now, I won't go into the details of Article 21 because it might bore you, but um, the, it really, paragraph one states that um, member states shall ensure that essential important entities take appropriate portion te technical operational and organizational measures to manage the, the risks posed to the security of network and information systems so it's a lot to put on um the all entities essential entities um which i think are defined in the beginning chapters of the of the NIST 2 directive which again i'm not going to go into um, but it, but it's a lot to put on, and it's it's um, it's obvious that that's going to worry the DNS industry um, because again that's p uh, imposing quite a lot of measures um, and with with some quite heavy fines of at least uh, you know we mentioned the fines um, but there's at least ten million um, euros or a maximum of at least two percent of the total worldwide annual turnover in the preceding financial year, um, which is meant to be a fine um, if you do not comply. So again, these are these are quite big things to, to think about um, that the supply chain as a whole really needs to think about. Um, yeah, but I, I will leave the other question to, to um, around cooperation um, to Prudence and, and Katrina. Thank you, Katrina. Would you like to pick up one of the questions or both? No, I think I think Georgia covered it very very well. Uh, that is indeed uh, uh, that worries uh, DNS uh, industry, CCTLDs, and um, well, I assume uh, uh, registrars as well. Um, speaking about uh, how to how to enhance or foster uh, collaboration, let's have a regulation on that. <laughs> 
something that would uh, make us uh, to, to, to collaborate. Um, but on a serious note, I think it, it moves uh, in that direction and uh, uh, any other artificial um, stimuli are not, uh, not needed. Uh, I think we will arrive to, to that point where uh, only together we can, we can do something. At least I really hope uh, that that will be the case because as I already said several times, we heavily rely on, on, on center and uh, all uh, big registries uh, who uh, are very generous in sharing their experience and, and their uh, solutions to, to problems. So. Thank you, Prudence, from some thoughts from you. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think Katrina summed it up really well. We need a regulation to help us implement and standardize the regulation, correct? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but in all seriousness, um, it's been said a lot, and I'm, I'm probably going to say something that's a little bit controversial, but I think, especially when it comes to stuff that involves the implementation from a European CC registry perspective, I think Centre will be at the heart of it because that is the main body where everyone does get the opportunity, the rare opportunity to all come together and all discuss topics and all actually like share and divulge information and be transparent in their approach. I just feel that at this moment in time, there needs to be a, a genuine commitment to trying to standardize. And I feel that centers should be at the helm of that and for and trying to enforce that kind of and there needs to be a genuine desire, I believe, for people to try and make this as as smooth uh, for registrants as possible, because ultimately, um, I think if we don't figure out a way to kind of make things uh, practical when we implement and make things as straightforward to implement as possible, ultimately what we'll see is a reduction in people engaging in registering at all, which is what nobody wants really. Um, but I think centre should be at the heart of it because it makes sense. It's a logical thing to happen. How we give centre the ability to uh, enforce things, we don't know. Um, is it a good idea to give centre the actual powers to enforce? Again, I don't know. Um, but again, it probably would make sense to try and do that as well. Thanks. Thank you, Prudence. And there is a, a note by Andrew, who is uh, also voting for a cooperation also in the respect of uh, sectors of supply chain, which are in scope of NIS2. So let me just quickly uh, recap before I turn for the very last uh, uh, word to the panelists and just that you can think uh, in advance, I will like to I would like to ask you to share with us the item number one or two on your to do list when you hear this too. So, <laughs> so today we, we went through the scene setting where Georgia uh, showed us the NISTU transposition tracker of the DNS Research Federation, which was uh, uh, really very interesting and with uh, great potential to different parties for the future. Then we heard about uh, the, especially the specifics of uh, a smaller CCTLD from Katrina and what are the challenges. Also a very interesting aspect of the small registrars and their importance to small registries and this problematic with the burdens around uh, NISTU and other regulations. Then we uh, had a look at uh, the impact of NIS2 on different stakeholders group, um, where Prudence shared with us uh, what it means to be a corporate registrar. And we know that not only Mickey Mouse works in white gloves. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for this as well. Uh, a very, very uh, interesting point. And then uh, uh, we also touched on the cross-sector cooperation and verification procedures we heard about the uh, ongoing research uh, uh, of Know Your Customer procedures in different industries by Georgia. We also uh, heard uh, about the cross-industry cooperation and the two working groups. And, and then, uh, of course, uh, yeah, the, what, what uh, the industry, what all the players uh, can do and should do to, to make the life 
mutually uh, more easy, so to say. So um, if you can uh, share now with us uh, what is on your to-do list as item number one or two, uh, when you hear this two. Uh, so Prudence, can you share? Sure. Um, item number one on what I need to do or what Mark Monitor needs to do with regards to this too. One to the hills. Um, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we're uh, trying to figure out is whether or identifying uh, discrepancies or niche requirements with regards to verification at specific registry level. Um, even though it's been really kind of pointed out that there are so many different articles that are impacting various different business models and various different uh, sectors. Um, we're registrars, we're selfish. Article 28 impact, impacts us the most. So that's why we're always going to be very focused on, on that. Um, and so for us, it's about figuring out and getting ahead of uh, which changes will have the biggest impacts with regards to how we operate. So we're taking a purely practical perspective with regards to our next steps and trying to figure out how we implement or how we create new processes to make sure that we're acting in compliance. Okay, thank you very much, Katrina. <laughs> yeah, I think number one for us is to maintain our sanity make sure that we uh, pragmatically approach the issue. Um, and well, probably number two would be uh, see how we can help our local uh, small registrars uh, who are not so well versed in, in all the issues of uh, NIS2, who do not participate in center or icon processes and probably have never heard of uh, the thing. So that uh, we need to help them. Okay. Thank you very much. And Georgia, from you. Well, so number one from us would be to, to really understand how this transposition is, is working for everyone and you know how they're implementing it. Um, but I think more importantly, number two, um, the motivation of the, of the directive is to achieve a common level of cybersecurity across the European Union, take, basically keeping us safe. So I think number two would be to understand what impact it has had on DNS abuse as a whole and on you know whether it has done anything to to affect that. Um, so I think that's number two for me. Okay. Thank you very much. So one last question. Or comment. What I just so why have the same Yes, and um, so so um, I didn't get your name, but um you asked a question on no, it's, um it, it was a comment yeah. I made a comment on the on getting the industry to work together different parts of the industry are all going to be affected by NIS2 um, and and it's important that we all work together in this um, I think I've got your comment right but do correct me if I haven't so thank you very much by this we are closing this uh, pre-session of the dynamic coalition on DNS issues Thank you very much to, to our speakers, panelists, to Prudence, Katrina, Georgia. Thank you very much. And thanks to you that you stayed with us and gave us uh, seven minutes of your break. We highly appreciate it. And I hope that uh, it was an interesting session for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.